and we're back with a brand new series, yeah, and this is not necessarily going to be a reaction, I will explain in a minute, but yeah, now we are doing The Rings of Power, Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, yep, this show is called The Rings of Power, and I've got my own Ring of Power right around my neck, not to mention, I have my Galadriel pop out here, because I know she's the main character of this show, and I am going to be bringing out a different Lord of the Rings autograph that I have for every episode. We are starting off with Merry Brandy Book. Because one of my goals in life is collect it's to collect all nine members of the Fellowship's autograph. I've got seven out of the I've got seven out of the nine. I am missing Frodo and Sam, so I still need Elijah Wood and Sean Astin's autographs. But the rest of them I've got and I'm gonna be putting some of them out throughout this show for every episode. So and yeah. Slight confession I've got to make about this. Uh, the first two episodes are going to be a rewatch because I was planning on doing a full reaction to the series, but when it first came out, I know it was a while ago, I'm watching it at the end of December, it's going to be New Year's Day in a few days. Uh, but yeah, in September, I watched the first two episodes in a special screening in cinema, and honestly, to watch Lord of the Rings in cinema is an opportunity you can't pass up, even if this is not directly Lord of the Rings so yeah it's been a few months since this came out I, I honestly have no excuse that I've not watched it besides laziness that's it so yeah hmm so these first two episodes I'm gonna do tonight are just gonna be a rewatch and then episode three onwards is all reaction because I've not seen I've not seen this show besides those first two episodes which I had a, foot, a special screening for so yeah I am not going to recap anything that I've seen in it because there'll be an. I'm not. I'm not going to recap anything that I saw in the. In the special screening because I'll do that for these first two episodes. So, yeah. As always, for every series that I start, the first episode of this series, this is going to be the full length for this episode is going to be free on Patreon because this series is going to be going on to Patreon. I think I'm pretty sure. And the reviews will be going on to YouTube. So if you're watching this on YouTube right now, you can go watch the full length reaction to it on Patreon for free. So, yeah, I have nothing else to say, really. So let us just get into Season 1, Episode 1 of Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power, starting right now. Okay, so that was the first episode. Write down a couple notes, if you can tell. Okay, we'll start off with some of the characters. We'll start off with some of the characters. Uh, Galadriel. Do I see Kate Blanchett in her? I'll, I'll tell you what I did. I saw more of Kate Blanchett's Galadriel in the younger actress, when she was a little girl, than I do in the older one. But that could change. And not to mention, she also has to go through the... There's one point when Elrond says to her, Without my sword, what am I to be? Listen, you you looked a lot... You were a lot more intimidating and formidable in The Lord of the Rings, and you didn't even carry a sword in that. The most you carried was a jar of water. And it's also interesting that she's so fixated on defeating Sauron right now, and yet she barely takes any part in the Lord of the Rings in the final battle against Sauron. So I wonder what leads her to that. So she's so she's so fixated on him now, what changes later on to the point where she decides that it's up to others? There's Elrond as well. So the two original characters we have from Lord of the Rings are Galadriel and Elrond. I didn't really see much of... Well, I saw a bit of Kate Blanchett in... I saw a bit of Kate Blanchett in this Galadriel. I didn't see a lot in this Elrond of Hugo Weaving. Except when I mentioned it in the reaction. Like when, he's, when he has a little smile on his face, a little smirk. I saw a bit of Hugo Weaving. Like I can imagine Hugo Weaving making that face. He is a good friend to her. He is a good friend. So it's odd that they share so few scenes together in in the original Lord of the Rings. You know, it's strange that this, this, 
their scenes together are so few, like, even together, even when they're standing together, there's only one scene for, like, five, ten minutes right at the end of the, the trilogy, when they're actually together. And then there's one where Galadriel is basically speaking to him over a distance, but they're not in the same... They're not together, but she's, like, rather speaking to him. And it would make sense that he's the one who writes all of the like, the speeches that the High King makes. Because even in the original trilogy, he had a... He had a very... Elrond very much had a way with words. He was very much a dramatic speaker. So it makes sense that he's the he's the one who writes all these speeches for the King. So he is, he is a good friend to her because he's telling her to... He's telling her to leave. He's telling... And he's saying that if... If... If Sauron is still out there, and she leaves, he'll make sure that her mission is complete, so he wants her to have peace of mind when she leaves, but obviously that doesn't end up being the case, because she she decides to come back anyway. So we've had Gladio, we've had Elrond, there is also Arunde, who's another elf, who is a stationed watchman, or guard at this at this town in the Southlands of men. And I've got a bit to say about the Southlands later on, which I only just noticed in this first viewing. In, th in this viewing, I noticed something for the first time. So, yeah, there's a bit of a reaction in there. But yeah, he's a stationed watchman here at this in the Southlands, looking over all these towns of men. And yeah, they're not exactly the people aren't exactly happy with the elves' presence. I wonder if there's well, there's, there might be some who there might be some who don't mind it, but there are also others. There are a lot more who don't like it. Because, like I said, they they hate the me the elves hate the men, the men hate the elves, and it's all coming about because the elves have lived long enough to see to see the evil that was once there. And they still hold that against the people of today, of now. So they're always wary around them, they're always suspicious of them, and as a result the the men have grown very resentful towards the elves because of it. So But I do want that one kid's gaze fucking teeth smashed in. That one who had a go at Rondir in the in the bar. Not the, not the bar, but the the tavern, maybe. Yeah, I do want him. I do want someone to smash his teeth in, please. So yeah, I said in the reaction, uh, well, the rewatch. I said I said as well that he might be like the heart. And, Aronde might be the heart and soul of the series, like the one who's just trying to do the right thing, and he's very genuine, very awkward, really, sort of like a Jon Snow kind of character, and it's clear that he's struggling with his duties already, because he clearly has an infatuation with Bronwyn, the the the, the healer of the, of the town and now he's just found out that she's part, that she was born in Horden, which is a town that was very very loyal to Morgoth so I imagine that puts him in a difficult position. And I do feel for Arondir as well, like he's just trying to help he's just trying to help, he's just trying to keep people safe, and as a result, it's people are hating him. Cause I imagine he'd well, obviously he doesn't feel the same way about the men that the other elves do, because the Watch Warden even said that... He says, we watch over them not because of what their ancestors did, but because of who they still are. So, obviously there are some elves, especially the Watch Warden, who still view them, the people, as evil, or potentially evil. But Arondir doesn't feel that way. He feels that people can change. I imagine Bronwyn is probably the reason that he believes people can change, because he doesn't want to believe that someone he cares for could be evil. Like he looks at he looks at this woman and he's like, how can she possibly be evil? How can she be part of this people? Like she he's looking at her and imagining she can't possibly be evil. 
so why should the rest of them be evil? But, yeah, too much past, too much past tensions has sort of strained relationships, really, here. And not to mention, there was also the mentioning of past pairings between men, between human and elves, has ended badly. Give it a few centuries and you'll find a, well, and a couple of references mentioning the past, the past of human and elves never never be in a good combination and then that lad in the tavern talking about about how our true king will return yeah give it a few centuries and you'll get both you'll get a, you'll get a king who returns a return of the king and you will get a pairing between a man a man and an elf and it will work out i think so yeah give it a few centuries but not right now i wonder Although I I'm not really into the love, I wonder if a Rondera and Bronwyn will work out. Or if it will all end in heartbreak. There's also Nori Brandyfoot, Eleanor Brandyfoot, the Harfoots, the precursor to Hobbits. I wonder if these are a travelling people? Because I do see a lot of similarities to the Hobbits, not just appearance-wise, but I do see a lot of similarities to the Hobbits, but there are also a couple of differences. Because if they're travelling people... The hobbits were very much not travelling people because the Harfoots are obviously the hobbits before they settled down in the Shire. So does that mean these people will eventually travel to the Shire? Because hobbits necessarily like to stick where they are and they don't venture away. Much like Eleanor Brandyfoot does in this. So Ellen Brandyfoot, Nori Brandyfoot is very much a... Uh, she's very much an adventurous little Harfoot. Yeah, half thoughts once again, they don't bother with the troubles of the outside world. They don't wanna they don't wanna bother thinking about it. It's not their concern as far as they they're concerned. Yeah, it's nothing to do with them and they don't want any part of it, which is very much like the hobbits. Yeah, they don't they don't What what was it the what was it the the one Hobbit said in the first film, keep your nose out of trouble and no trouble will come to you? So yeah, and also there was the the little prophecy in the book, kind of the what was his name? Sadok was reading the head, the head, uh, head half foot. He was reading a little thing that showed uh, a drawing of the the people, the hunters, and then after that it showed a drawing of a wolf. And we did see a wolf in this episode. And I am worried because it says the book implies that first the hunters come and then the wolves will come. And because of what Brandyfoot was doing, they were in the garden and now they've just been seen by the wolf. Is the wolf going to track them back to the Harfoot camp and cause a bit of damage? And that's really bad if it... If Eleanor, if Nori Brandyfoot is the reason that that happens. So yeah, I wonder if I wonder if El Nori Brandyfoot is uh, an ancestor of Merry, possibly, because Merry's last name is Brandy Book, where she's called Brandyfoot. So I wonder if she's like an ancestor to him, maybe. If like the name just changes a little bit throughout the ages, I am I am curious. But then she's also got to deal with this new arrival who arrived in the meteor, which is weird. But we'll see where that goes because obviously, like I said, only seen the first two episodes, don't know much else. So that's so that's Nori Brandyfoot off the list and half half foots as well. Oh yeah. There was also Keller Brimbor as well, who, like I said, I know is a part of the the Shadow of Mordor games, but I haven't played those. I haven't watched any like I haven't watched like the story of it on YouTube or anything. I don't know anything about those games. Only that it's not necessarily canon anymore. But yeah, interesting. Interesting that they brought him in, and he's going to be working with Elrond. 
on a project that I will talk about when it shows up in the next episode. First of all, we're not going to any really familiar places in Middle-earth so far, like we've not been to Moria, we've not been to Shire as it is yet, we've not gone to Gondor, Rohan, if they are at all that yet. Uh, the Lothlorien, Rivendell, Shire, Moria... Yeah, we've not gone to any of those yet. So I wonder if we will at some point. Because there is one location that I think we are we have spent some time in already. And yet I will talk about it in a second. And I'm quite excited. So excited to return to Middle-earth again, but also curious to all the new places that we're going to visit that we haven't already in the Lord of the Rings game, in the Lord of the Rings films even. I do feel that we haven't, we've missed an opportunity with Morgoth. I feel like we should have seen Morgoth at some point before, because obviously Sauron is what they're hunting now because Morgoth has already been defeated. So I feel like why are we missing, why are we skipping over Morgoth when we could spend some time with him before going to Sauron? But then again, Sauron is the more familiar enemy that we've got to deal with. Sauron is the enemy that we know, the one that we're, the one, the one that all Lord of the Rings fans are familiar with. Not to mention that, ooh, that, that silhouette of the shadow that came over the tree, and then the silhouette of Sauron walking among his orcs as well. Wonderful. The music was on point in this episode, in this show, really. I do. I know they brought Howard Shaw back to do the main theme, but nothing else, and that's disappointing, really. Galadriel's theme, I love. I think it's very good. Is that the one Howard Shaw did? I don't know. It might be. Because I know that he was brought back to do the main theme. And Galadriel is the main character, so does that mean the main theme is Galadriel's theme, and that's the one Howard Shaw did? Because it's definitely the most Lord of the Rings sounding theme I've heard so far. I've heard a lot of themes in this episode that sound very fantasy. If I can find one, and maybe you can hear it first. Okay, that theme, I wouldn't exactly call it bagpipes, but I don't know what sound that, I don't know what sound, what instrument makes that sound, but that, but that theme, when we go to the men's village in the Southlands, we're going back to the Southlands again, and yeah, it's very fantasy sounding. If anyone knows what that, because we're back on YouTube now with the preview, uh, does anyone know what instrument makes that sound because it sounds so fantasy so put the name of the instrument that makes that sound down in the description just so i know because i don't know at the moment but yeah sounds very fantasy and yet the, the galadriel theme sounds so epic the galadriel theme sounds more lord of the rings because god god the Lord of the Rings soundtrack. Ooh, you... Come to me and say you know a better soundtrack. I, I will tell you that you're lying. But yeah, back, speaking of the Southlands, we're back in the Southlands, and we also found a Morgul Blade as well. So, that little kid, Theo, who is, I think, Bronwyn's son. I don't know, is he a little brother? Because he seems a bit... Either she seems a bit young, or he seems a bit older enough to old to be her son. She looks too young to be his mum, and he looks too old to be her son. But yeah, it is her, it is her son as well. I don't know, it, either she looks great, she looks great, because honestly if I looked at her, I would not say she's any older than 30, but yeah, then I'd say he's around teenage years, like early teens, so yeah. I don't know what I was thinking, but I just thought I just thought that the age was a bit different, but I guess not. I, I definitely wouldn't say she's older than 30, but I guess she must be, if he's like in his between 12 to 15 years old. <sighs> oh well, but yeah, he's found a Morgul Blade, and it looks like he has a bit of a connection with it as well, so 
is he going to be a Black Rider? Is he going to be the Witch King himself? I don't know. Because that would be cool if we could see the origin of the Witch King. Or any of the Black Riders, really. But then again, the Black Riders are supposed to be former Kings of Men. So... So does somehow Theo become a king? He's definitely got. He's definitely going to be having a connection with that blade, and he's also going to be manipulated by it. And he's going to turn evil. I think. I'm pretty sure. I'm like. I'm like eighty percent sure that he's going to go evil because of that blade. But then again, the, the Black Riders, they're supposed to be former kings of men. And Theo is most definitely not that. But I'd just love if this series just showed us the origin of the Black Riders and stuff. Because obviously he doesn't have that. He has Fell Beasts, which we saw in the, like, the... Yeah, Sauron definitely has Fell Beasts because of the... Because of the little... Fl uh, not flashback, but the little glimpses of the war. So he has Fell Beasts already, but he doesn't have any Black Riders as far as I know. Yeah, oh, finally, onto the Southlands, the thing I've been desperately trying to avoid all this review. The Southlands. Little clues were being thrown about throughout the this, this, this episode in the visuals, and then I finally got it when we saw the map at the end. Like, when we were leave, when You know the transitions when we go, we go over the map when we're leaving each place and going to a new one? Oh. I... First, first clue was the watch, well, no, first clue was when we were looking, Aronde was looking over the land, and we saw a single mountain in the background, and then eventually there was another showing, in a, in a different perspective, but it was another show, and it looked like a volcano, it looked more like a volcano, which it definitely is, it's definitely more of a volcano. So, and then second clue was when the Watch Warden said, can you believe this place used to be a barren wasteland of rock and everything? Third clue, saying that this place used... People in the towns around this place used to be especially loyal to Morgoth, who was Sauron's master. So there's evil. Evil has been at play here before. And then fourth and final clue, when it comes up and it shows the map, I see the outline of mountains around the Southlands. And this brings me to my conclusion. The Southlands is Mordor. The Southlands is Mordor. It's the southeast of Middle-earth. Because yes, this is called the Southlands, but Mordor is in the east, so this is the southeast of Mordor. This is the southeast of Middle-earth. The Southlands is Mordor, so yeah, <laughs> Sauron is definitely going to be showing his face here because this is his base of operations. So yeah, excited to see that if it indeed does happen in this season. Yeah, very interesting. That that one revelation that I got in this in this viewing has made me more excited for this show than I was before. So yeah, very excited and very interested in what's going to happen in the Southlands. So, Aronde's story just became much more exciting to me. But, mm, like I said, music was on point for the most part. Doesn't feel very Lord of the Rings except for the Galadriel theme, but the music is also still on point. Visuals, on point. It's not quite Lord of the Rings, but it's still on point. The acting is quite decent. The acting is decent. I'll take it. I suppose the only thing I'm truly missing is original actors. I wish they could have somehow found a way to DA, D, uh, CGI de-age uh, the likes of Kate Blanchett and Hugo Weaving for this. I wish they could have found a way to do that because that's the one thing, that's the one connection that I'm missing to Lord of the Rings. Because we have Galadriel and we have Elrond, yes. But we don't have original actors. We don't have some of the original actors, even in the Hobbit, which I think is okay. But I don't really, con I don't really like it con compared to Lord of the Rings. Like, if you compare anything to Lord of the Rings, it's not as good. But uh, 
but The Hobbit, at least it had the connection of having Orlando Bloom as Legolas, having Ian McKellen as Gandalf, having the flashback, well, having the... Because obviously all of The Hobbit is a flashback, but in the in the contemporary time, you had Ian Holm and you had uh, Elijah Wood. You have Christopher Lee, you have Kate Blanchett, you have Hugo Weaving. So you have all those things. You have all those original actors come back. And it it helps the connection a bit. It's a connective tissue between the two. Whereas, yes, we have Galadriel and Elrond, but we don't have the actors, so there feels a disconnect. Not completely, because we've still got Sauron, we've still got Galadriel, and we've still got Elrond, so there is still that. But we don't have the actors to make the connection seem legitimate. So, I wonder, I wonder if we'll get that at all throughout this series, or this season, really, because I know they're doing a season two of this show, and I hope... I hope that if even if they don't do it in this season, they do do it in another one. So, hmm. Yeah. I am excited to return to Middle-earth. Lord of the Rings is one of my favourite franchises of all time. I am very excited to be part of this again. To be watching... Well, I would say watching Lord of the Rings at the same time it's coming out, but I'm not. Because this show came out a couple months back. And I'm only just catching up now. So, yeah. That's all we've got for this week this episode of Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Until next time, we are over and out. Bye!